All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation. Talk by Fashion and Economist, as well as the Chief Executive Officer at Global Analytics, is joining me right here. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Fashua. Welcome to the show. It's been a while. We've seen, I think, my Congress in November. We have not seen since then. Oh, yes, it's true. Yeah. yeah it's been a while. It's yeah, been a while. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Cheers. Catalyzing inclusive economic growth, hmm. achieving inclusive economic growth. Uh, when I was having a show, I think last Friday or so, it just dropped in my head that I really needed to take a look at this. I said, okay, fine, let's do a series on it because economic growth and the inclusiveness of this is what really, <laughs> yeah. really broaden our economy and give us the prosperity and the progress we want. So I I'm doing a series on it. <sighs> One, I think my first question will be inclusive growth is what? Mm -hmm. It's, an, it's a growth that is inclusive, actually. <laughs> 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 so basically, uh, inclusi inclusivity yeah. in everything is very, very important. You know, in fact, um, inclusivity uh, many times trumps expertise. So mm. if you have a scenario where you have so many experts, but you look at those uh, experts and you say, well, how come they're all men, right? Um, how come they're one from one certain section? Anywhere in the world, it's a valid question to ask. Because, for example, look at even in boardrooms, they tell you that yeah. if you're able to get women up to 30% yeah. of a board, the decision changes. Yeah. And, you know, you're likely to see an upward trajectory. Uh, because if it was all men, everybody is talking adrenaline. And, you know, before you know it, they're talking about what Ferrari they want to buy. And before you know it, the, the board can veer off on a different uh, tangent and so on. Uh, so inclusivity is about getting voices in. For example, you know, you can't actually uh, focus on who is smart alone. You want to get perspectives because, you know, both of us are looking at something. If I see white, you may be seeing light blue, right? And we need to be able to bring all those perspectives to bear. In terms of um, um, economic growth, uh, the bottom line is without sounding like a socialist. I know, you know, Nigeria has a problem with um, uh, income inequality a lot. However, the way to also look at it is to say that, indeed, you know, um, we live in a winner-takes-all world where um, those who are close to power, those who are close to economics, they take it all and run with it. But we would actually have a bigger economy if we're able to drag some of the other people along and say, okay, what do we do? You have to think for them. Uh, societies will be judged based on how they treat the most vulnerable people amongst them and how you tap into it. For example, you know, um, in the world over, they would say, listen, you have to, t you have to take care of people with, with living with dis disabilities. You have to incorporate them even in the corporate space. Some of the smartest people I know, I mean, we had Stephen Hawking, right? Yeah. You know, some of the smartest people I know, uh, well, li they live with uh, disabilities that are smart up here. And some of the best ideas will come from them. So uh, when you talk about economic inclusivity, we're saying that just like financial inclusion, uh, we're saying that we can't live in a world where a few people take it all. Uh, we're saying that we cannot, um, we cannot minimize, if you like, the, the contributions of different sections of the economy. So if Nigeria is growing at 2%, 3%, projection 3.5% this year, which I've always attacked as being too low, um, you know, uh, we could do a whole lot better if we can devise strategies to bring people up and, for example, children uh, who are not in school uh, and those who, uh, you know, that trajectory, those who have been in school and dropped out, uh, even people who didn't go to school at all, everybody has something to contribute. These days we find a scenario where um, uh, a lot of blue-collar jobs pay better. For example, yeah, we are, they're beginning to see that, but they can be encouraged. We don't pay our artisans anywhere near enough. If you went to UK, US and co, in some environments, in some communities, you can be a dentist here, the next person is a plumber, the next person is some sort of artisan, the automobile repairer, and so on. And, and they live together because they're able to establish a certain minimum and they have respect for skills. Mm. So we need to also bring that to the table, respect for women and their contribution, respect for people with living with disabilities and their contribution, respect for people who are artisans and who have skills, and, and also being able to pay the right wages uh, for required skills in society. You know, um, like I said at the beginning of the program, I've heard different economists say, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who is uh, Nobel Prize winning in economics, Paul Krugerman. I don't know, it's like I'm really, I don't want to say falling in love with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> 
lately I've been reading a lot from them yeah. and lately because they are also the proponents about it's not just economics, it's not about money, it's about right. money, mm. it's about human beings, it's about Absolutely. people. Yeah. But we, we tend to have focused on the top line number for a long period of time. Uh, the recipe and the formula uh, have not really done much in terms of economic growth. Why do you think that the time is ripe and right right now to begin to look at beyond GDP? Because one will talk about, okay, economic growth is GDP. What you do, what I do, the recharge card I buy, whatever my cameraman is doing and all of that all adds up to make up GDP. But why should we be discussing this right now? Beyond That's GDP, yes. yes. In, in fact, I remember sometime in 2006, uh, got on, I mean, not Gordon Brown, David Cameron, uh, you know, did say something like, uh, you know, that we need to begin to look at gross well-being. Mm. And he was talking about the UK economy. As far back as, um, yeah, David Cameron, I think it was. Yeah, 2000 the, the, the 2016, yes, there about, yeah. anyway. Um, so um, be before that, I remember Robert F. Kennedy did say, that the GDP doesn't measure a lot of things in society. Sometimes it measures the wrong things. It may measure how many bullets were produced by an arms manufacturing company, but it doesn't measure things like, you know, artistry. It doesn't measure the work that women do just keeping a home, mm. which, I mean, if you had to employ, you know, uh, you employ maybe a maid or a housekeeper, they'd have earned, you know, they would have earned quite a bit of money from you then, but your wife does that work. You don't think that you should quantify that and add, you know, let us know just what women are contributing in society. So a lot of things like that have been uh, left aside. Uh, and, and of course, it's more imperative for a country like Nigeria to begin to think beyond GDP right now. Uh, because, number one, we do have a problem with our statistics. We have a problem with how we arrive at our GDP in general. You know, even the, the, the proponent, the, the inventor of GDP, Simon Kuznets, yeah, yeah. in 1934 did say that, look, this thing is inventing. It's just one of those instruments you can use. It cannot be the be all and end all. It's going to be fatally flawed and all of you, yeah, all of that. So, um, but sometimes, you know, I think we've used GDP because it's just convenient. It's a nice number that everybody quotes, but the point is, how accurate is your GDP at any given point in time? In a society where people will hide information from government, you can't actually mm -hmm. tell, you know, the size of, you know, only recently, with the use of technology, government is gaining grounds, you know, getting information, using BVN and all of that, getting information on how much people have and all of that. Otherwise, you know, we don't reveal information here. So, uh, but, but be that as it may, um, it is it not too bad to focus on growth for the, for the um, just for the heck of it, if you like. Um, but um, you must quickly move beyond the issue of growth to say, what about human development? Um, you know, the average Nigerian, is he getting better in many ways than one? Uh, even in terms of this growth thing, uh, talking about poverty, there's what the World Bank evolved. There are two things, the Human Capital Index, and also what they call multidimensional poverty. poverty. To yeah. say that, um, whereas you may not be poor money-wise, per se, you can feed yourself, but if you fell sick in the middle of the night, there's no hospital near you to get to, all right? The quality of life you breathe, I mean, the air you breathe when you're walking down your street, the, the unpacked gutters, the stench, the whatever. Access the to Susceptibility, toilets, all exactly, all of those things. Yeah. Susceptibility to diseases and so on is what reduces that. So uh, it's great. I would propose, I would propose um, that Nigeria targets a much higher GDP growth, hopefully, um, but from an inclusive perspective. So it's not a case of, okay, if the crude oil market was doing well, yeah. Nigeria we can grow at uh, 6, 7, 8 percent. No. And right now, the crude oil market isn't doing Dang well. Yeah. It's been trending down as a result of uh, coronavirus, $54, cru um, you know, Brent crude. Chances are that if this coronavirus thing continues, uh, you may see even a further dip. The Chinese economy has been predicted to grow at no more than 2 percent this year. Which is, like a, which is like a huge depression. Yeah. More for than them. half of what And it could actually grow. be worse. Yeah. If coronavirus continues for another three, four, five, six months, you can be sure that that economy is going into a recession this year. Because by every means, you know, number one, uh, less goods are going to be imported from China any which way. Less reception to Chinese people who come to Africa and other places to do business and all of that. More scrutiny. Mm. to cargo, Along therefore that slows chain. down the logistics yeah. processes. And of course it's going to be, it can also reverberate around the world. Meaning that this is a good time for countries to think beyond 
the normal measures. You have to look inwards and look at the power and the strength of your people. The other day I was on a program and we were talking about capital. And well, we were discussing my book, The Race for Capital. And you know, the book was premised on uh, when uh, you know, Thomas Piketty wrote his book sometime in 2012 or thereabout, uh, the, the you know, capital in the 21st century. So we started, I, I was looking at, OK, how does this affect Africa? All right. The truth is, there's a race for capital. A few people in some parts of the world are getting a lot of that capital, all right, uh, because they've been able to purchase technology. Mm -hmm. And in purchasing technology, you are substituting labor. Mm -hmm. So if there was something that you needed 10,000 people to carry before, now you need one or two machines to carry them. So why do you need 10,000 people? All right. So uh, and being that, that as that may be that, OK, you're able to use capital to purchase technology in order to substitute labor, we have labor, meaning that more and more in the chain, we're going to have a lot more idle people mm -hmm. while the world is making money, producing for the generality you know, in those parts of the world, and so on and so forth. So what do we do? So I realized that, look, our capital is our human beings that we have here. So now if we have 13.5 million children on the streets, uh, that's our capital. So rather than go even going around to borrow money, we should be thinking about, OK, in medium to long term, we must make sure that, that our capital does not waste. Those children must be picked up. They must be pressed into service. Mm. They must be made into people who can develop and understand how to contribute to society. We can't waste that capital. You know? And again, a single person, a single child, all right, can give you Business can generate enough, you know, create companies that can generate enough to double your GDP. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So that's now the way if we still stick with that economic growth or GDP in the context of Nigeria, why do you think that economic growth is not distributed fairly? Yeah, it's ca it can be, it can be distributed fairly. You know, I mean, in economics, we talk about economic growth, we talk about development yeah, itself so. as distinct, you know. So growth is your GDP, calculate it, and so on. Uh, people have brought other indices like HDI, Amartya Sen brought HDI, Human Development Index, the World Bank as well, Human Capital Index. It, it's very interesting about the HCI is that <coughs> Nigeria is 152nd out of 157 countries. Uh, only five countries, all of them in Africa, that were better than. However, we scored 34%, and that means that uh, a child born in Nigeria, averagely, has 34% chance of achieving its potentials. All right. So yes, you have the ones that go to Grange School and Atlantic Hall, and they're probably going to do better. You know, however, that's also risky. Uh, but you have those ones who are born everywhere, every day, who don't even have a chance, you know, to, to make anything of themselves. But maybe become barrel pushers and keke drivers or kada riders and so on. You know. So it's unfortunate that that's something that should actually worry us. So, but but GDP will all. I mean, the GDP growth itself, economic growth itself, will always be on balance because again when you measure growth what you're measuring is the economic activity that you see all right so in this instance if one or two companies or one or two sectors does well then you say oh we have all done well then the question now yeah. will be can economic growth be balanced in such a manner that it involves everyone not only absolutely. in those growth generating sectors absolutely Do you know, can, exactly. it, can it be balanced it's going to be a tough tough call but it is a, a it is a, a venture that is worth uh, going into. It's going to be a tough call. It's going to be a long shot. It's going to be a long term, you know, kind of um, thing, medium to long term, to say because what that means is that okay, for example, we we do try to do that from time to time. You know, the central bank brings out policies on lending. You know, intervention policies in different sector. You know, this morning actually I was reading about Kebi rice farmers and you know, some of the problems they have with them and so on. The so when when program, they are able to pay yes. back. And again, also, uh, we have microfinancing. They've tried that. You know, sometimes I always warn that it's not just about putting money. access to money or even putting money in people's <laughs> pockets, right? Yeah, so fundamentally, we know what the issues are. Uh, I'm actually writing a paper on that right now. And for example, you have to really focus on, 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 on education. You have to really focus on the basic prov provision of what they call public goods, all right? And how do you, because public goods are those goods that you cannot ex exclude anyone from, all right? If they are free to, 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 I'm looking at that image on that screen now, and mm -hmm. you see a typical Nigerian street, all right? You see the kind of dishevelment and the exposure. This alone is called um, visual pollution. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you have such things being beamed to you on a daily basis, 
it kind of affects, it's like you're writing things on your, on, on your brain, like you're writing files on your brain. Imagine, compare that to living in maybe somewhere in downtown Chicago or downtown New York or in Wall Street or living, you know, even in a village in Europe. You see that the image that they get beamed to them on a daily basis is different. So we have to, we have to be able to say, look, not again, that this is an uh, unacceptable, uh, an unacceptable way of life for our people. So that, you see, the, the growth, the real inclusive growth that we're going to get is going to come from the mind. Mm -hmm. Are we able to reshape the minds of our people? Are we able to sell greatness to our children who are in the millions? And how do we understand that these numbers of people is our real capital that we're not amassing? It's going to be a long uh, you know, journey. It's going to be a tough call, but it is doable. I think, like they say, that the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. Okay. The next best time is today, immediately. So it's something mm -hmm. that I believe that we should begin to work on uh, immediately. Now, the question will be that um, even as the government has said it's forecast or is forecasting a growth of 3.5% this year, the question I would like to ask the Minister of Finance, perhaps as you as an economist, is growth for whom, isn't it? Yeah. How and exactly. what are the desired outcomes? I, 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 yes, I know you understand what I'm saying. Growth yeah, sure. for whom, really? Growth for who? Because no, if you're saying 3.5%, percent, perhaps while they were calibrating that, they were thinking, okay, all price will be at 60 US dollars, 65, 75. In fact, when I was listening to the legislators, their debates in the House, I was one of those that warned, and I think the MPC also warned at that point. Guys, just take a look at this thing. Who knew there was going to be a coronavirus? <laughs> so the 3.5% mm. growth was for whom? For whom by whom? By whom? I mean, where what are, are they expecting the yes, growth what are your from? Where were they expecting the growth from? The first from? quarter is almost gone now. Yes. So where were they expecting the growth from? What new? And you know, when you want to achieve growth also, you have to think in terms of, okay, what new thing? Now, there's going to be a certain aspect of growth that will be totally stochastic mm. in terms of, you can't predict it. For example, coronavirus, black swan event. Mm. A certain virus appeared that nobody could take care of. And that sends everybody into a panic. That makes people close down. There's going to be a sort of, if chi chi Chinese uh, economic growth is slowing down to 2% or lower, you can be sure that that will reverberate elsewhere. The U.S. will feel it because U.S. gets a lot of Chinese imports. imports yeah. So there are companies set up in the U.S. that oh, they feed on but Chinese But China imports. says that U.S. So should halve their tariffs now because of this exactly. thing. Exactly. That's why yeah. when there's that generally low, slower um, pace of development or economic growth in the, in, in the world, then people buy less fuel then the crude oil price, price goes down. down yeah. I've always said it, and, and we, we, many times uh, we talk about what they call the Brownian motion. We talk about what they call the random walk, that if you chart any um, asset over a long period of time, what you're going to be seeing is a kind of zigzag, because sometimes, you know, I mean, most times, uh, and whatever that goes up must come down. It may not come down to the old level. So chances are that in this world we live in, of course, there's going to be a time when crude oil will go back to $10. But there could also be a possibility that crude oil will eat $200 mm. at some point in time. Now, that tells you that it's not, what, it's not an asset that you should actually base your oh, whole economy on. on. The problem we have here is that once we are able to lock down crude oil, we say, well, you know, the money is going to come. No worry. Everybody begins to spend. And that's not the way to plan an economy in the short, medium, or long term. So it will be good. You know, part of, perhaps even, you know, that the, uh, the budget of a country is very, very important in terms of determining the growth of a country economic growth in a given year. Very, very, is the most important document that a country will make because the government of a country is the most important spender and even the largest spender in any economy around the world. I've checked it, even the most capitalist economy. The U.S. government is the biggest spender in the United States. You can't match them, all right? So, so what that means is that at that level of planning, we want to see, I've always said we wanted to see, the only overriding assumption in our budget is crude oil. Crude oil price, that's the first thing you see. Mm. Crude oil price, um, you know, uh, uh, crude oil production, 2 point something million barrels a day. Uh, expected price or projected price, X number of dollars. And that's it. Though so we would like to see, um, you know, the way budgeting is usually done is to say, okay, this is crude oil price. This is what we expect. This is the mines and steel or whatever, solid minerals. This is what we expect. This is whatever capital venture Nigeria is doing. We want to, we want to see it at that point. You populate your income sources. In fact, that's where you challenge different sectors to do more. All right? That's where you challenge different sectors to do more. You use your budget to incentivize productivity in a society. 
all right? Mm. By, and regulation is also a premium. Mm. Because I realize that, you know, regulated industries seem to do better because there's no anyhowness, quote and unquote, mm. in such industry. You can't just operate a bank today and say, okay, you want to run your own bank just because. No, you have to pass through a process, you know, and then they will give you a license. That license is, you know, a license to make money once you get it, if you are, if you are careful. It's, that's why it's a wonder to me why people get banking licenses and then run it aground. Look at what Jimovia has been able to do with his banking license, which a lot of them got in the e late 80s to early 90s. He was able to sit on that license and look at where Zenith Bank or whatever it is today. You know, so, so there's always that premium. So uh, we, we, we need to broaden our mind and rethink. And let me say, uh, of course, a lot of debates go on in the National Assembly and elsewhere, but, but we need to see more intellectual debates. Um, I'm not sure the kind of debates or the kind of discussions and the, you know, that we need is such that will be held maybe not even openly on some floor with people maybe lounging about, even making, a no making noise, moving everywhere. We need, we need a lot of brainstorming in this country to think things through. Mm. Perhaps so that, that we'll come out with very out-of-the-box, genuine ideas that, that will take us to, you know, that, that will to. take us to another discussion for another week, mm. which is the leadership the selection yeah, process. Perhaps, yes. yes, because leadership would also give birth to perhaps the kind of intellectual debates you are, you are talking about. But let's go back a bit to what you said earlier, which is quite interesting. And for perhaps smart economies, they've been able to uh, to, to put that in, into, into use, talking about the gender gap, talking about yeah. including women. For example, I know that I think in Norway, which Norway comes up in, is a Scandinavian country, comes up like almost number one. If it's not number mm -hmm. one, it's number two. in some of these indices. Yeah. And when I looked it up, Norway is just a, has a population of five million people. Mm. Finland too, the same thing, I think 5.5, .5, all those Nordic countries. Norway, I think in 2003, imposed a gender quota, obliging companies to have 40% of women mm. on their boards. Um, what does this really do if we really go at it? Because if we take a look at 200 million people in Nigeria, half of women are women. Uh, like I said some months ago, it's smart economics to include women Absolutely. into all of this. So what mm. do you think we are really losing in terms of inclusiveness? You see, unfortunately... It's, it's something we must talk about, you know, social, traditional, socioeconomic barriers and all Unfor of that. Unfortunately, you know that, I'm sorry, you know, the, um, the people ruling the roost now are mostly male, uh, kind of old, 60s, 70s, maybe late 50s. Yeah. They're the ones you see. The average age so is about they, 60, what they do is they, And they've been able to acquire capital. They can elbow people out, you know. And I, I, even politically, there's an issue now about the deregistration of some of our young parties, which we're fighting. It's not going to work. It's not going to stand, you know. But it's about shutting down, you know, the voices coming from different places. These so-called people, a lot of them who grew up in villages and have traditional mindset, Many of them, do you know that in this country today, some people will tell you, I cannot be anywhere that will be led by a woman. Yes, they, they do. cannot be in a community, yeah. committee led by a woman. They cannot be in a state led by a woman. They cannot be, come on. They cannot be in a company led by a woman. What's that for? So, but however, it takes a whole, I don't know, you have to like take their brains out and put in new ones, like replacing a, a car engine so that they will think differently. So when you have such fundamental misgiving and fundamental discrimination, then you have a problem. Mm. But not only women, even youth. Yeah. Now, with the concept of youth in Nigeria, concept of youth in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, elsewhere, I mean, we're talking about elsewhere, 16 years old, you're on your way out of your father's house, right? Go and get a job. It doesn't matter. Even sometimes your father may be rich. And then you go to the nearest McDonald's and do a, a, an internship. Here we don't have that. And, you know, when you have that kind of thing going on, I try to force my children to do that mm. sometimes. You know, yeah. on their holidays, man, let's get busy, do yeah. something. Be get creative, see what it is like to work in, in a corporate environment. Even it doesn't have to be very corporate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a dirty job. You know, so it's a kind of wiring that we need. But the earlier you press these categories into service, the better for you. People living with disabilities, in pe many parts of Nigeria here, people discriminate against them. They look down on them, they say, who is this one? Meanwhile, like the best brain. You know, let me tell you, because God, again, God doesn't share these things equally. Sometimes if you are fit, you look good and all that, you may not just be smart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that person is on feet and, you know, but may, may have the best, the thing that they're looking for. Stephen Hawkins, for example, yeah. that I said. So, you see, a different kind of, you see, we need people who are exposed 
to what's going on in the rest of the world. People who know just how much you know, they need to include other people. People who are humble enough that to know that no matter what they know, they, they, there's still a huge gap. All right, because nobody knows it all. So you have to bring in people. And people who can manage that leadership process such that if you bring in people, you are also allow them to grow, allow them to breathe, allow them to be heard. But right now, we're, we're doing this Machiavellian politics. And the politics of this country also affects the economy. The politics affects everything, especially the economy. So if you don't get it right on that political front, you're going to put misfits into government, uh, and even people who are so so masochistic, if you like, um, you know, that, that, I mean, like the other gentleman who was boasting of his four wives and 27 children. Those are the kind of things that you're going to see. Those ones can't understand what we're talking about. They can't understand the need for Nigeria to manage its uh, resources very tightly because, again, you know, we believe that once we see $2 billion, $10 billion from crude oil, all our problems, but that $10 billion is meant to grow 200 million people, all right? 90-something million of whom are crassly poor, according to the World Poverty Index, about 96 mm. million now, unfortunately, yeah. when India is down to about 75 million. Yeah. About 98 million. You know, so that brings me to the question of the power of 200 million people. Right. The power of 200 million people. And when I look at, when I looked at it, or what, of course, that's what I do every day. Not so much. With close to 100 million people that are poor, that live on less than $1.90 a yes. day or $5.50 uh, uh, US uh, dollars, that's $5.50. The power of 200 million people, what strategy should government adopt right now, as if they've not adopted it, to ensure, to promote social inclusion, to promote that long-term growth, to promote sustainability? The power of 200 million people, are they really harnessing it? Because what I'm seeing, the symptoms I'm seeing is that of kidnapping, insecurity, oh, yes. joblessness, unemployment. You see mm. youth coppers, how many thousands of them all every year? What is their hope? A lot of things. And, yeah. you know, so um, anyway. My, my, my perspective will come a little bit from the left, actually, because it's something I've always ruminated over. We've tried several strategies. We've tried credit, microcredit. We've tried entrepreneurship, um, what they call solopreneurship. Most Is of it people we've tried or we're still trying? We're still trying them. In fact, this mm. morning I was reading this article about this guy who sells things in the traffic and makes one million naira every month. Uh, but he makes one million naira because he sells, and then he goes to recruit a hundred more people to sell in the traffic. And I said, look, whereas, you know, you try to en en entice our youth with that kind of thing. And some people will even say, uh, you say you're a graduate, look at this person making this, so better forget your degree and go and sell things in the traffic. It is not the way, I is that the way yeah, they're selling exactly. it in New York? Are we not supposed to be trending towards the best practice? You know? So, so we've tried all of those things and they seem not to be working. In fact, to make matters worse, like you said, we're beginning to see uh, insurgency, insecurity, kidnapping, yahoo, yahoo, and all sorts of things going on in our society. So I will come from the left. Let's talk about public goods, all right? Education. If you have 13.5 million children outside, you need teachers. That's what you need, teachers, right? And you must get those teachers and take those children of the school, uh, of the street, and build schools for them. Uh, security. If you have this scenario, that's why I kind of support the Amotekun idea. Because, um, you know, eh, the first thing is you must be able to protect people, human beings, lives and properties. We need to employ more people into the security sector. Whether Nigeria police force or Amotekun police force or the Northern Nigerian police force, whatever you call it. You know, states, by now, we're seeing that our, our, our federalism is coming under the, the pressure, all right, to do the right thing. Now you can't say, okay, Nigeria police is going to be just this police that's in Abuja. They will give instruction to everybody. Nigeria has evolved more than that, whether in terms of population or complexity and all of that. So we're talking of education, security. We're talking about the environment. There's a lot of things that we can do in that environment to reorient it and, and also employ people in, the, in that sector. I could take one million people mm -hmm. in the environment today. Then we're talking about, you know, we're talking about other things like in society, health sector. All right, so if you're able to like focus strongly, Norway and Finland that you mentioned, those Scandinavian countries have set a social democratic model which can't be matched anywhere. But you find out that in those places, 30% of people work in the public sector. But in the public sector, not in secretariat, pushing fires up and down and looking for who's going to drop whatever for whoever. You know what I'm saying? 
They're there on the streets. In many, many villages in this country are totally forgotten, off the grid. No lights, no water, no road, nothing gets there. So it, perhaps one of the things you may do is to have mobilization officers who go to those places, even, even if all they do is buy their lunch in those places, all right, they interact mm -hmm. with the people there. We need young people at that level. To, you know, I remember Mamsa. Mamsa in the 90s. Yeah, 90s That's yes. the kind of thing you mass need. Mass mobilization. Exactly. Or, it's, yeah. it's, 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 look at us now. We have mass mobilization and social welfare for, for in that time. Look at Nigeria now. Where youths of 20 years old, 18 years old, they're there on Twitter, on Facebook, cussing themselves out by tribe and religion and all of that. Now, that now is the time, those are the youths that let them get off Twitter, now, push them to now the village to go and get you, some, you, some From what you've said right now, le let me bring out this question, which is, because if you're talking of economic growth or inclusion or inclusiveness, you're also taking a look at population economics and all what of what have you. I asked earlier the power of 200 million people. That brings me perhaps to, you know, the kind of generation, the social structure. Let me put it that way. We have generation Y, we yeah. have generation mm. Z. I don't know which generation yeah. you belong to, the generation before, you know. Mm. But the social structure mm. of our population right now, you, uh, if, it, if you take a look at perhaps what is happening right now, the economy, economies all over the world is changing. Digital economy is changing a lot of structures. In terms of, if you take a look at the, perhaps like 20, 30 years ago, perhaps the biggest company in the world could be AT&T. When I was taking a look at their figures, 260 something billion dollars. As at that time, the biggest company. But now, Apple, the likes, I Amazon's mm -hmm. over 1 trillion US dollars. So how do you connect the dots between the, digital economy, changing yes, things, so and the social structure of what we absolutely. have right now, the generation Y, the generation Z, what are they pursuing? Uh, some time uh, ago I was... That may be another topic. No, well, very quickly, uh, some yeah. time ago I was doing an assignment on my PhD, and that issue of generation X, Y, Z, and, and so on came up. And I had to tell them, that, look, I'm sorry, but this doesn't seem to match what I have in my area, my country, because... Um, you know, Generation X, I think I belong to that. that generation yeah. Y are supposed to be the millennials are yeah, there. They, from the the they, said, they said that the millennials are spoiled people. They have all the opportunities. They can choose jobs. I think well, the millennials yeah. in my country well, yes. are having it tough oh, because it's actually those, the ones before us that had that choice of jobs and all of that. These millennials that are growing now, 20 years, 25 years old on the, the street, Z. they are suffering. They didn't get anything because rather than our economy growing when the U.S. economy and coal were growing, mm. ours was trending down. So that, that tells you a story. But there's a connect between what I said because what, the reason why those economies are doing very well is mm. that the superstructure, the foundation has been laid. That's why you will go, the other time, you know, our president was in London, and that was when the security issue was up. And, I, and people were saying, no, why, you know, why do you have, uh, I'm going to take all of those things. I said, well, you know what, the president is in London now. London has a London Metropolitan Police. There is Scotland Yard there as the federal one. Then London has community police. You see them wearing a red and a black stuff like that. Without this. guns. They don't have guns. They just take the batons. Mm. That's what we need. Okay. So I said, look, because it's safe, the country is safe. People go there for tourism. 